Seasonic, the heart of your system. What is up guys, this is Luke Hill for KickGuru and I'm here sandwiched between four X570 motherboards and no, this isn't just for fun, it's all for a perfectly good reason. So today we're going to be looking at X570 motherboard VRM temperature testing. So we've picked a quadrant, quartet, I didn't really know what four is, we picked four. We picked four motherboards from the £210 price point and we're going to look at which one has the best VRM performance. Are there any that are better than the others? Are there any that are not so good? Are there any you should completely avoid? Who knows, let's have a look. We think £210 a nice price point if you're really going to splash out in the 12 core. Realistically, you'd probably be spending more, but who knows, maybe in six months the price will come down, maybe in 12 months you find a good second-hand deal. So these motherboards are when you start getting a pretty good power delivery solution, so they'd make a pretty interesting price point in our opinion. So we're going to be running our testing today with an overclocked, overvolted 12 core Ryzen 9 3900X, and that's going to be housed in a fractal design Meshify S2 chassis. So we're looking at real-world performance testing. Um, I've seen a lot of tests in Testbench, and I love this. There's some really good YouTubers doing some really good testing. But I thought it'd be interesting to run in a case to see how that differs to what the results have shown. So full disclosure, we've obviously got one of the boards from each of the main four vendors here. So we've got ASRock, we've got MSI, we've got Gigabyte, and we've got Asus. Full disclosure, Asus and ASRock sent us over their samples, and we purchased the MSI and Gigabyte versions ourselves, simply because they weren't available through our UK contacts. Anyway, that's enough talking, let's jump into the motherboards. So first up, because you know, alphabetical order and all that, we've got ASRock's £210 offering, so this is the X570 Steel Legend, and as we can see, it's an ATX offering, it's got a camel style print on the PCB, I don't really know what to call this, it's largely black and silver, but anyway, let's look at the power delivery solution. So focusing on the power delivery solution, ASRock deploys an 8 plus 2 phase total physical implementation, the combination of Intel ISL 69147 PWM plus the ISL 6617 phase doublers gives ASRock a 4x2, so 8 total phases, 4 doubled for the CPU vCore VRM. The SOC is 2 discrete phases and this is handled by the PWM controller directly. Focusing specifically on the 8 phase CPU vCore VRM, ASRock is using a total of 8 Vichy SIC 634 DR MOS power stages. So these are rated as 50 amp continuous output power stages. They actually deliver 10% higher current for short 10 millisecond burst loads. So they can go as high as 55 amps, but they're 50 amp continuous power stages. And these are obviously a DR MOS solution. So they integrate the high side and low side FET as well as the driver for the MOSFET. So the SOC two phase is handled by a pair of Vichy SIC 632A power stages and these are very similar to the 634s handling the V-Core but they're slightly derated to around 45 amps. They could probably push a bit higher but the spec sheet doesn't go up to that. So like I say slightly derated and they feature some slightly different thermal monitoring capabilities. Not too dissimilar. Heavily overkill for the SOC to be perfectly fair. So it's good to see ASRock deploying quality components there. So it's worth noting that ASRock is actually using 12,000 hour rated capacitors and this is important because you typically see 5,000 hour rated capacitors on some lower end motherboards. Now this is a £210 motherboard so clearly it's not lower end but the X570 platform is expensive so it's quite low end for the X570 platform. So it's good to see those 12,000 hour rated capacitors. In terms of heat sinks, I would say that ASRock's efforts are pretty poor, to be fair. I mean, these are mainly aesthetic. They, they do look pretty good. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves about that. And they feel pretty good to touch if you've got a thing about touching heat sinks. You know, I'm not going to judge. But they're not very big, to be honest. They're clearly not designed for an enhancement of surface area. They're not very efficient when surface area comes to it. Yep, there are some slots here and there and you get a through channel to slightly increase the surface area, but there's no real fin design. So clearly ASRock is looking to leverage the efficiency of those power phases underneath. Now the distribution of ASRock's power delivery system is quite important here because you've got the, the bigger 82 gram heatsink, which is in more direct airflow in a typical case configuration that is tasked with handling all eight of the CPU vCore power delivery phases. So you get, if you want to do a simple kind of back of the envelope calculation, you might get 10 grams of metal mass per CPU power delivery phase. And that's very crude and doesn't really mean much, but you know, it's a good met metric to compare, I guess. So all of that heat's going to be dumped into this relatively small heatsink, while the top heatsink that only handles the two core 
uh, two-phase, sorry, VRM for the SOC is 61 grams and it doesn't really do all that much unless you're loading it with the APU. So if you're an APU buy and you really want to push that iGPU, this could be a good ball for you actually because you get a pretty decent cooling performance for the SOC. However, there's going to be a lot of energy going through that 82 gram left side heatsink handling the CPU VRM. So Asus's 210 pound compressor comes in the form of the Tough Gaming X570 Plus Wi-Fi. That is a stupid name. It's just far too long. There's no need for that, but whatever. That's a completely different topic, I guess. Technically, this is the Wi-Fi version, which is about £225, but we did check with Asus, and if you buy the non-Wi-Fi version, which is £210, there's no difference as far as the power delivery solution goes. So just ignore the Wi-Fi card in our testing, and it's a £210 motherboard. So Asus equips this board with a 12 plus 2 phase power delivery solution. So even by X570 standards, that's pretty beefy indeed. And especially on a relatively budget X570 motherboard, that's good to see. So how does Asus deploy this? Well, first of all, Asus is using a proprietary ASP1106G PWM controller, and that's a 4 plus 2 phase capable controller that's probably built by Intersil, to be perfectly honest. Probably a decent controller, but you know, 4 plus 2, that doesn't equal 12 plus 2. So clearly, Asus is using Dublin. No, it's not. So instead, Asus is going for a fat design. So as we have seen from Asus's recent motherboards, Asus, instead of using phase doublers where you get a latency penalty, they prefer to use just a triple or double solution without changing the PWM phase count. So they're using four phases in this configuration to drive three sets of electrical components per phase. So that gives you 12 physical phases along which you can balance the load and the thermal output but you don't get the granularity of the control of those 12 phases. You only get four control phases, so four signals being pushed through. Now, Asus is adamant that this approach is pretty good. To be fair, it's probably a lower cost approach than using doublers, but there are some benefits to it. Focusing specifically on the CPU vCore VRM, so the 4x3 phase design, you get Vichy SIC639 power stages, and of course these are DRMOS power stages, so they integrate the high and low side FETs and the driver. These are pretty good power stages, like we see from ASRock. So they're slightly derated compared to the 634s that we see with ASRock. They're more comparable to the 632 that ASRock uses for the SOC, actually. But they do feature some inbuilt thermal monitoring. So that is a strong positive compared to the 634, which is more of a dumb DRMOS solution. Current-wise, they're rated for up to 50 amps of continuous output. But the spec sheets top out at about 45 amps of output, depending on which frequency range you're dealing with. So these are more like 45 amps amp power stages realistically as opposed to the 50 amp and up to 55 amp SIC 634s. Either way when you split in that 45 amps per stage across 12 stages that's a pretty beefy VRM to say the least. The SOC is using the same SIC 639 power stages. It uses two of those to drive the iGPU on an APU for example. The SOC gets two specific phases from the PWM controller, but unlike the CPU vCore VRM, there's no tripling or doubling of components. They are simply one phase and one set of electrical components. So capacitor-wise, Asus is using 5,000 hour rated tough black capacitors. So, of course, these are lower than we'd typically see on a high-end Motherboard, I know this is not a high-end X570 motherboard, it's an entry-level X570 motherboard, but it still costs over £200, so 5K capacitors on the front of it may seem a little bit cheap in this market segment. However, Asus's marketing material suggests that these are actually 5,000 hours rated for a higher temperature threshold, so 125C instead of 105C. So when you look at the exponential statistical um, calculation for which capacitors are derived from, or capacitor lifespans, I should say, are derived from, that 125C for 5,000 hours is actually particularly high. So when you take that down to 105C, like other capacitors are rated, that will be significantly higher than the 5,000 hours rating that we get here. So that's pretty decent to see. Maths aside, when you run at a realistic temperature of maybe up to 80 degrees Celsius or something in a heavily loaded environment, the lifespan of these is going to be perfectly fine at reasonable temperatures. So ASUS is clearly banking on efficient power delivery from the Vichy power stages because the VRM heat sinks used here, they're just not very good to be honest. There's no real 
effort to thin the design. I mean, yeah, you get a kind of a, a tiered approach to increase the surface area somewhat, but there's no real thinned effort. So, you know, I'm not going to give them too much credit for this heatsink design. Interestingly, with these heatsinks, Asus actually deploys an additional thermal pad on the heatsink, which contacts the inductors. Now, the inductors are bigger than the MOSFET, so they have more surface area to dump away their heat, and they are rated for very high temperatures in excess of 100 degrees Celsius. So you typically don't really need to cool them with a heat sink. It might be better, it's not necessary, but you know, you got, you got to credit Asus for doing that, I guess. So weight-wise, Asus actually manages to one-up ASRock for stinginess when it comes to heat sink metal mass. So the left side heat sink is 75 grams and the top side is 38 grams. So the difference here is that Asus's top side heat sink is about half the mass of the left side heat sink. Yet the distribution of power delivery components is pretty balanced with seven total phases on either side. So you're probably going to see an asymmetric cooling performance or temperature from the MOSFETs when you're measuring them. And that is simply th through sheer metal mass for the larger left side heat sink. So that's one to watch out for. I've made the comparison to ASRock clearly with the, the stinginess of the heat sink, but actually when you look at the left side heat sink, which is 75 grams, which is a little bit lighter than ASRock's, it's only tasked with managing six power delivery phases for the CPU specifically. So it actually gets a slightly easier load than what we see from the ASRock design, which is slightly heavier with a bit more metal, but was tasked with managing eight power delivery phases. Another benefit for the X570 Plus is the use of a six layer PCB. So this is pretty good to see on a 210 pound, relatively affordable X570 motherboard. So next up we have Gigabyte's 210 pound competitor, which is the X570 Aorus. Aorus, Aorus, I still can't pronounce it. I don't know, somebody tell me below, please, how you pronounce it. The X570 Aorus Elite. So Gigabyte deploys a 12 plus two phase power delivery solution. And this is the same as what we saw from Asus, of course. So you have 14 total power delivery phases. So the combination of ISL69147 PWM controller and the ISL6617 phase doublers gives you a 6x2 configuration for the CPU and a 1x2 configuration for the SOC. So Gigabyte's deploying this 7 phase controller in a 6 plus 1 phase configuration. Clearly the bias is on the CPU V core here, which I think is a good thing. Focusing specifically on the MOSFET solutions and the power stages, Gigabyte is deploying the same Vichy SIC634 DR MOS power stages that we see from ASRock. This time, however, we've got a dozen allocated to the CPU V core. So these are good power stages, like I've already said, 50 amp current capability. They can burst up to 55 amps for short 10 millisecond periods. Good thermal resistance rating and if you've got a dozen of those that is a pretty high current capability output so we shouldn't really see any problems driving our 12 core even in a heavily overclocked configuration the one by two phase soc vrm configuration uses one of the isl 6617 pwm phase doublers and it also has to use drivers because gigabyte has chosen to use uh, discrete dumb mosfets if you prefer for this SOC. You've got OnSemi 4C10N and OnSemi 4C06N. Discrete MOSFETs used for the SOC and Gigabyte makes it slightly fatter so it doubles it up so you get two high side and two low side per phase. As these are dumb MOSFETs without a driver IC, Gigabyte is forced to use the Intersil ISL 6625 driver IC, which adds a little bit of cost to be fair. If we assess the V-Core alone, using the 12 SIC634 Vichy power stages. That's actually the exact same configuration that you get on the ASRock X570 Tai Chi. So that's a 300 pound premium, premium-ish for X570 motherboard. So it's pretty good to see Gigabyte not cheaping out on the power delivery solution here, despite this 210 pound price tag. This should be a pretty good performing unit, just like the Asus one. One area, unfortunately, where Gigabyte is clearly cheaped out is the capacitors. So these are 5,000 hour rated capacitors and there's no extended uh, temperature threshold for these. So they're 5,000 hours at 105 degrees Celsius. So these are undeniably cheap compared to ASRock and Asus's. Also worth noting is that Gigabyte is the only capacitor in today's 210 pound offering to offer a single 8 pin power connector without the additional 4 pin. That's not really an issue. I wouldn't read too much into that. Just Please do not make a purchasing decision based on that. It's not a problem. So continuing the trend of subpar heatsink design, we see another set of metal 
blocks which are designed more for aesthetics, and they do look good to be fair, but they're designed more for aesthetics than efficient cooling performance. There's no real surface area increase via vertical fin stacks, although you do get a few cutouts horizontally here and there, which does increase surface area a little bit, so not a complete disaster, but no real efficient heatsink design methodology applied here. So the larger left side heatsink is coming in at 133 grams weight, while the top one is 60 grams, so almost a two to one split. So despite the two to one split of the metal mass, the left side heatsink is tasked with handling nine of the CPU power delivery phases, while the top side heatsink only has to manage three of the power delivery phases for the CPU, plus the two SOC phases. So you think that the left side heatsink is gonna be pretty heavily loaded by comparison to the top side, but that's a choice that Gigabyte has chosen to make. So this is one of Gigabyte's four layer normal loss PCB designs, not the six layer PCB that we'll see on some of the higher end offerings. So MSI's compressor comes in the form of the MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. Just like Asus's version, this name is annoyingly not long. It just doesn't need to be that long. So MSI is using an eight plus two phase power delivery solution on this motherboard and that is driven by the International Rectifier's IR35201 PWM controller. So undeniably premium PWM chip used here, probably the best of the bunch to be perfectly reasonable. So the 35201 is used in four plus two phase mode, which means you use five IR3598 PWM phase doublers or dual drivers and they mount on the rear side of the PCB in an uncooled configuration. So four out of these five phase doublers, the IR3598s, are used in doubling mode, and they are to take the four PWM signals for the CPU V core and create eight usable phases out of that. The other single IR3598 remaining is used in dual driver mode. So rather than doubling a phase, this actually takes two input phases from the PWM controller and gives you two output phases, which can drive two discrete, so damn MOSFETs. And this is used for driving the two phase SOC. VRM. So when you break it down, MSI's 8 plus 2 phase design is actually a 4 by 2 plus 2, so pretty reasonable for a 210 pound motherboard on the X570 platform. Focusing specifically on the 4 by 2 phase CPU vCore VRM, MSI is using uh, 8 pairs of on semi uh, discrete MOSFETs for the CPU vCore, so you get 4C029N MOSFET and 4C024N MOSFETs for the low side. One thing to note with these MOSFETs also is that their thermal resistance rating, according to the spec sheet, isn't particularly great compared to the Vichy power stages, so that could be something that's quite interesting for the heatsink to manage. The SOC is handled by two discrete MOSFETs without a driver solution, so the IR3598 on the rear is used in dual driver mode. I actually couldn't find any details about these MOSFETs, so I tried googling the part number listed on them, couldn't find any details, so they're perhaps even more basic than the on-semi ones being used for the CPU VCO. So yet again we see a heatsink design that is more focused on aesthetics than efficient thinned heatsink design methodology. So the larger left side heatsink weighs a massive 247 grams, while the top side one is 84 grams, which is still rather impressive to say the least. Clearly MSI is accommodating for the rather basic MOSFETs with limited thermal resistance by just brute force in the heatsink. So it's trying to apply more coolant to the MOSFET so that they can keep their current output capability without overheating. Far from an elegant approach, but you know, brute force sometimes works. So that roughly three to one split for heatsink mass is actually pretty much ideal as far as CPU vCore VRM goes. You get six power phases down the left side and you get two CPU vCore power phases on the top side. So clearly the larger left side heatsink has to handle three times as much load as the top side heatsink and it weighs three times as much. So that's actually pretty smart from MSI. So one of the benefits clearly of using a large metal mass on the heatsink is that you get thermal capacitance performance. So for short, uh, bursty loads from a high core count CPU, so maybe just a couple of minutes or so, where you're really pumping a lot of heat through the MOSFET. These large heat sinks can handle that very well because the specific heat capacity of the metal and the overall heat capacity via the heavy mass of the metal will resist any high changes in temperature for the MOSFETs 
that's good for short duration bursty performance but for long duration sustained performance like in our testing the heat sinks will eventually saturate and they will need to dump that heat off somewhere and because they're not really a particularly efficient heat sink design which is the same for all the motherboards on test here they might not be able to shed that heat very well so mass is good for thermal capacitance not so great for all out cooling performance which is what we're interested in in our testing today to be fair though, overall I'd say MSI has the best heatsink design out of all of the motherboards, sheerly by brute force to be honest. This is a massive heatsink, so unless you're really pumping a lot of power through the VRM for really sustained periods of time, this is a really good heatsink. Obviously the other boards make up for that by using really efficient power stages, so six of one, half a dozen of the other. The trade-off that MSI has gone for is a very big, well-built not necessarily efficiently built, but well-built heatsink design. So performance testing wise, we'll be running each of these affordable X570 motherboards with our Ryzen 9 3900X 12 core CPU overclocked to 4.25 gigahertz at 1.35 volts. So that's a pretty hefty task for these relatively affordable, relatively entry level X570 motherboards because you're pushing close to 200 watts of CPU only power there solid task it'd be interesting to see how they hold up in this scenario so because voltage accuracy is quite hard to compare between the motherboards because these don't have onboard checkpoints we're relying upon software readings we're applying a 1.35 volt v core and then we're using the load line calibration to try and get this close to 1.35 volts if the software is telling us that voltage accuracy is changing under load Another check that we'll do, which is arguably more important, is look at the wall power draw. Because if the software readings are just simply wrong, the wall power draw will tell us that. So in the case of the MSI board specifically, the wall power draw was, was a lot higher than we actually thought it should be at 1.35 volts. So we had to compensate accordingly by dropping the voltage in the BIOS, changing the LLC. And even then, the load power draw from the wall was actually still higher than the competing solutions. So we try to keep everything on a level playing field by keeping the voltage the same and checking that with load power draw from the wall and compensating accordingly where we thought we needed to. So we run our usual test system inside a case this time rather than open a test bench. And this is because, as I said in the introduction, we want to look at how these motherboards perform in a case. I've seen some of the other videos and some of the other testing, which is on an open air test bench, which is really fantastic testing. So I like what the other YouTubers are doing. Really interesting to be perfectly reasonable. I like it a lot. But I want to see how this performs in a case where we've got some airflow, not a massive amount of airflow because we removed the front two fans from our Fractal Design Meshify S2 case and we replaced that with a Corsair H100X Dual 120 AO cooler and we used some deep cool 1850 RPM fans on the front mounted as intake and then just the single Fractal 140mm fan on the rear as exhaust. So no top mounted exhaust fans. The ambient temperatures were in the UK where nobody has air conditioning is held between about 23 to 26 degrees celsius and where there are slight variations we will retest and retest to make sure we're happy with the readings and then we'll normalize all of our temperature readings to a 25 degrees celsius ambient so our load test case is a really heavy one and rather than use something like premiere pro or handbrake where we might get slight variations with the loading we actually just chose to use a stress test so ada64 so we run ada64 for the cpu stress test ticking all the cpu boxes for one hour straight and then we measure the temperature from multiple thermometers after this one hour test run. So for the testing equipment we're using several K-type thermocouples mounted in several different locations and we want to use these several locations so that we get a balance and an understanding of how the th thermal performance is changing across the motherboard and if there is any change. So our specific regions of interest are on the left side MOSFET bank at the bottom because this should be one of the cooler ones. We also position a th K-type thermocouple at the midpoint on the left side because statistically speaking that's likely to be the hottest MOSFET because it's getting all the heat from the nearby components. We place another K-type thermocouple on the top side bank of MOSFETs to look at how the CPU or SOC MOSFETs in the case of ASRock's board are performing up top when there's minimal direct airflow in the preferred orientation and then we also mount uh, the K-type thermocouple on the rear of the PCB underneath the left side MOSFET hotspot to see what the PCB temperature is doing in that region. For additional testing where it's necessary, we also use a K-type thermocouple mounted on either the front heat sink or the front PCB near the inductors or anywhere else where we feel it's necessary just to validate some of our performance figures. 
as we were mounting our K-type thermocouples directly to the MOSFET surfaces because we wanted to look at MOSFET surface temperature, we had to go out and buy some different thermocouples. So rather than using the ball end thermocouples, which basically feature a blob of metal on the end of two wires, because these could slightly disrupt some of the uh, cooling performance by effectively creating a mound underneath the heat sink, and there's also a uh, risk of shorting out some of the components. So we went out to buy some flat loop-ended K-type thermocouples, and these use a capped-on tip uh, mechanism to keep them in position. The reason that we decided against using thermal imaging was because we were more interested in the MOSFET temperature, the surface temperature. Anyway, that's enough of the test configuration. Let's have a look at our test system components. So our test system consists of the AMD Ryzen 9 3900X 12 core CPU, cooled by a Corsair H100X 240mm AIO. Memory comes in the form of a 2x8GB 3200MHz C14 G-Skill kit, which uses Samsung BDI ICs. Pixel pushing duties are handled by the Beastly Gigabyte Aorus RTX 2080 Ti Gaming OC with a custom fan speed curve to minimize GPU boost clock reductions. Power is handled by the absolutely overkill and highly efficient Seasonic Prime Titanium 1000 watt power supply and we're using Windows 10 1903 with the latest updates and AMD power profiles. So because there's a lot of data and a lot of analysis to provide in this video, so I would recommend that you go over to Kikuru and read the full written article with all the written charts and the written analysis there. The way I'm going to do this is I'll leave the charts on screen so that you can look at the data and then I'll voice over the charts. And then at the end, we'll look at a comparison between all of the motherboards on the same chart. So alphabetical order, first up is ASRock with its X570 Steel Legend, which features the double date for its CPU V-Core VRM using Vichy SIC 634 DRMOS power stages. Our overclocked settings resulted in about 245 to 250 watts power delivery from the wall. And the CPU voltage was actually pretty accurate according to the software sensor readings. Importantly, we saw no signs whatsoever of VRM-induced frequency throttling for the Ryzen chip. So that's good to see for an extended loading period like this. So tick in the box straight away. Looking at the MOSFET temperature performance, we saw a maximum temperature of 73 degrees Celsius when normalized to 25 degrees Celsius ambient. The highest temperature reading was actually displayed on both the bottom and middle mounted power stages in ASRock's configuration, which is a little surprising at first. It then becomes clear why the central power stage is operating the same temperature as the end power stage. ASRock puts the entire bank of eight phases feeding the CPU to the left of the motherboard and underneath the single 82 gram heatsink. One hour is long enough to reach thermal steady state and the nearby MOSFETs operate at the same temperature. 73 degrees Celsius is hot, but it's no real cause for concern to be perfectly honest. According to ASRock software based sensor reading, the motherboard VR Loop 1 sensor showed 69 degrees Celsius, so this reading is not too far away from our direct measurement, which is good. Our thermocouple mounted on the top side bank of MOSFETs above the AM4 socket highlighted the, that the SOC doesn't get pushed particularly hard for CPU only loads. The reading stayed below 50 degrees Celsius throughout testing. This does, however, highlight some degree of inefficiency with ASRock's power delivery layout. Two of the eight CPU power phases could have been shifted to this region so that their heat load could be placed on the secondary heat sink. Perhaps this is not deemed an issue, as the recorded temperatures levels were fine anyway. The rear PCB recorded temperature was high at just under 85 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot for a motherboard PCB. Clearly a significant amount of thermal energy is soaking into the motherboard PCB rather than through the heatsink. A better heatsink design and more efficient physical distribution of the MOSFET power stages would have compensated for this. We also noticed that the top side power stage temperature rose by a couple of degrees when the system was powered down and airflow was removed. This implies that the heat from the PCB is soaking into the top VRM heatsink and causing a rise in MOSFET temperature, even if it is only for a few minutes before starting to cool again. Thankfully, the PCB temperature drops quite quickly once load is removed. However, that may not be the case if a heavy GPU or X570 chipset load has been applied in tandem. After five minutes of the load being removed on system shutdown, the CPU side power stage is cooled to just over 50 degrees Celsius, while the PCB was just under 50 degrees Celsius. This is a decent cooling rate and shows that the heatsink can flush away its thermal load, even if the system is shut down quickly after a heavy load. So moving on to Asus's Tough Gaming X570 Plus Wi-Fi, we see the first of our 12-phase solutions at this price point. Our overclocked settings resulted in power draw from the wall that was practically identical to ASRock's competitor at about 245 to 255 watts under ADA64 load. 
we didn't see any signs of VRM induced throttling by CPU clock speed drops. So annoyingly, Asus doesn't include VRM temperature sensor readings through software tools. This is despite the SIC639 DRMOS power stage is actually featuring uh, thermal sensing built into them. So it's pretty disappointing to see this, to be honest, because software readings are quite useful for people who are just looking to monitor the temperatures for worry-free computing. Looking at the MOSFES temperature performance, we saw a maximum temperature of 66 degrees Celsius when normalized to 25 degrees Celsius ambient. Unsurprisingly, the highest temperature reading was displayed by the central power stage mounted above the CPU socket beneath the small VRM heatsink. The central and lowest power stage is mounted to the left of the CPU socket beneath the larger VRM heatsink, operated around 4 degrees Celsius cooler at 62 degrees Celsius. A maximum temperature of less than 70 degrees Celsius when mounted under Asus's anemic heat sinks is a good result and speaks volumes about the tough X570 Plus's VRM solution. Balancing a hefty CPU load pushing close to 200 watts across 12 physical phases allows the load per phase to be reduced compared to lesser phase count solutions. That's one of the positives of Asus's triple fat four phase design. This translates into solid operating temperatures according to our results. As we also saw with ASRock's board, the Vichy DR MOS power stages do a good job for this level of load. The rear PCB temperature measured beneath the central MOSFET from the left side bank hit a maximum of 63 degrees Celsius when normalized to 25 ambient. It's a six layer PCB, it looks to be handling heat soak from MOSFETs pretty well as the PCB temperature is absolutely no cause for concern whatsoever. Also aided by the six layer PCB is the cooling rate directly after load removal and system shutdown. After about five minutes, the MOSFETs were down to the mid 40s and the PCB cooled even quicker by dropping below, just below 40 degrees Celsius in this time period. So now looking at Gigabyte's X570 Aorus Elite, we now see the other 12 phase competitor at this price point, albeit delivering those dozen CPU phases via quite a different method. Our overclocked settings for the Gigabyte board resulted in power draw from the wall that was very close to the Asus and ASRock competitors at about 245 watts. We recorded a maximum temperature on the Vichy SIC634 MOSFETs of 67 degrees Celsius when normalized to a 25 degree ambient. Comparing the data between our sensors, it is clear that Gigabyte's mounting distribution of the power phases and VRM heatsinks is smart, as there was never more than a 1 degree Celsius difference between the two left side power stages that we monitored and the top side one. When we compare our recorded data to that of the ITE chipset-based VR MOS sensor that feeds data to software such as HWM464, sensor readings of 68 degrees Celsius imply good accuracy and relevant data that users can trust without needing to break out the thermocouples like we did. As was the case with Asus Tough X570 Plus, a maximum recorded temperature below 70 degrees Celsius is a strong result for an affordable X570 motherboard handling an overclocked 12 core CPU. The rear PCB temperature peaked at just over 70 degrees Celsius. This is a decent enough result, especially when Gigabyte's use of a lower cost 4 layer PCB is factored in, but clearly it's not as strong as Asus's result. The cooling rate was also perfectly good on the Gigabyte model, with the MOSFET sensors and PCB sensor showing readings of less than 60 degrees Celsius after just one minute of load removal with no system airflow. So MSI's 210 pound competitor here, the, here we go, MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi. It uses an eight phase power delivery solution for the CPU, just like ASRock's board. So it'll be interested to see how temperatures compare. As we've already mentioned in our testing procedure, it was actually quite difficult to get this board to behave properly in regards to system power consumption from the wall. So under 1.35 volt load and with an appropriate load line calibration setting, the wall power draw was actually 20 to 35 watts higher than what we saw from the competing solutions. So that implies that either the board is really inefficient, which I don't think is the case to that degree, but what it does imply is that the sensor readings are perhaps incorrect and we're not actually getting the true voltage uh, being delivered to monitoring software. So to compensate for this, I went back into the BIOS, dropped the voltage a bit, dropped the load line calibration accordingly and checked the power consumption from the wall. So we still had the stability when using 1.32 volts under load due to load line calibration according to the software. And this resulted in about 250 to 265 watts power draw from the wall. So still higher than some of the competing solutions, but that just seems to be one of the caveats and one of the trade-offs with this motherboard and this BIOS solution. So another of the challenges that we had with testing this MSI board was because it didn't use co-packaged single uh, DR MOSFET power stages, 
we actually had a really difficult time getting the thermocouples that we chose to stick onto the high and low side FETs. So this was not only because of the high and low side FETs, because in theory you're just asking it to stick onto a package and then you can mount the heatsink on top of it, but the heatsink and the thermal pad were also particularly difficult to get back in place while the we were trying to get our thermocouples to stay in position. We did manage this, but it took a lot longer than usual. Um, there was slight movement every time we applied the heatsink and then reapplied it. So this could deliver some challenges with our thermal recording. So be interested to compare our data from our thermocouples compared to the data from the PCB, which we're confident is perfectly fine, compared to the data from our handheld IR thermometer, and also compared to the data from the sensor readings, which this motherboard does use. Another of the challenges was electromagnetic interference. So we actually saw higher EMI on this motherboard than the Gigabyte and Asus competitors specifically. ASRock had particularly high EMI also, but this was very, very high. So we had to take our measurement readings by killing the load quickly following the one hour stress test quickly take the readings and then very quickly kill the power. So within about 10 seconds, we could kill the power and get accurate readings without uh, any EMI being induced into the system. But in this period of time, obviously there are slight changes in the temperature. So that's something to worth bearing in mind. Under load, the temperatures that we're seeing or recording are probably gonna be a little bit higher under actual load conditions. So we recorded a maximum temperature of 80 degrees Celsius with our thermocouple mounted on the left side center MOSFET. One challenge with this reading was our thermocouple could sometimes bridge across the high and low side MOSFETs as this board was particularly difficult when installing the thermocouples as I've already highlighted. Nevertheless, 80 degrees C from our thermocouple is undeniably high compared to the alternative solutions at this price point. Interestingly, the left side bottom MOSFET actually ran around 7 degrees Celsius cooler at 73 degrees Celsius. The top side MOSFET also ran cooler at 67 degrees Celsius when normalized to a 25 degree ambient. The difference in recorded temperature between the center and bottom MOSFETs on the left side of the CPU socket implies that the center one is having difficulty in shedding its heat. It doesn't take us long to find the source of this difficulty in shedding heat, the PCB temperature. Topping out at more than 105 degrees Celsius on our thermal couple and we actually read as high as 114 degrees Celsius in certain spots with our laser thermometer. The PCB temperature anywhere near the MOSFETs was ridiculously high. We wanted to make sure these alarming readings were correct, so an additional thermocouple was mounted on the front side PCB to the right of the inductors. Its reading was 100 degrees Celsius also, so we were confident in the results. We did many, many retests, many remounts of the thermocouples, so we did, I think, eight tests in total, uh, three different positions for the thermocouples and additional thermocouples mounted to check that this was correct and we were happy with the readings and we were happy with the readings especially the PCB temperature readings which were high to say the least. To say that a PCB temperature of more than 100 degrees Celsius is alarming is an understatement. With this temperature level I would not feel comfortable running this kind of workload on a frequent basis. Also bear in mind that there was no GPU M.2 SSD or X570 chipset load to dump in additional heat into the motherboard PCB. Checking the sensors from the International Rectifiers PWM controller and a Nuvaton monitoring chipset in HWM464 highlighted readings of just under 110 degrees Celsius in both cases. While the MOSFETs may technically be able to operate at these temperatures, the levels certainly aren't good for longevity or peace of mind, which is important when building a system. Considering that the run-in temperatures of over 100 degrees Celsius were highlighted by the International Rectifiers and Nuvaton sensors built into MSI's motherboard, in addition to our own PCB readings in several locations using a laser thermometer and multiple K-type thermocouples, we're more than happy to believe those readings. The difficulties we had with the EMI and the correct mounting of the thermocouples on top of the high and low side MOSFETs imply that our recorded MOSFET temperatures are possibly lower than the actual temperatures the MOSFETs are running at. MSI's power delivery solution on this motherboard is not well equipped for handling an overclocked 12 core Ryzen part. That's disappointing, especially when its competitors all face so well. At least the cooling rate from MSI's massive heatsink was a positive. The MOSFETs and PCB dropped to around 50 degrees Celsius five minutes after the load was removed and with no system airflow. If you're picking this motherboard, I would advise topping out at one of the eight core chips where you're not really gonna stress that VRM as much. So when it comes to raw MOSFET temperatures, both Asus and Gigabyte put in the best performance when it comes to our testing results. 
There's a little between these two solutions though. Asus did display slightly better temperatures for the left side MOSFETs thanks to a CPU vCore VRM and heatsink di distribution. The PCB temperatures were also a little better for Asus thanks to its use of a six layer PCB compared to Gigabyte's four layer. Despite the Asus board offering marginally better temperatures for the MOSFETs overall, the accuracy of the inbuilt temperature sensor for Gigabyte's X570 Aorus Elite was a clear positive. It's a shame that Asus's motherboard does not display VRM temperature readings in OS-based monitoring software, because based on our testing, Asus shows excellent performance and has absolutely nothing to hide. This gives you peace of mind that you are running within spec and you're running at good temperatures when you can see the reading in software. So it is, like I say, disappointing that Asus doesn't include this and Gigabyte and actually the other competitors for that matter, they do include the reading. So ASRock's X570 Steel Legend displayed solid performance from its lower cost 8-phase CPU vCore VRM. The MOSFET temperatures were higher than Asus and Gigabytes, but the margin was not cause for concern to be perfectly honest. ASRock's board also featured a VRM temperature sensor reading in the monitoring software and it proved to have a reasonable degree of accuracy in our testing. One area where ASRock was not as competitive as the Asus and Gigabyte alternatives was with the PCB temperature. This is likely due to the deployment of all eight CPU vCore power delivery phases to the left of the AM4 socket, thus resulting in more localised heating that is increasingly difficult to conduct and dissipate from the PCB. However, one clear area where ASRock's X570 Steel Legend has benefits is to APU users. The two-phase SOC VRM actually gets its own dedicated heatsink and maintains the use of pretty powerful Vichy DRMOS power stages. Users looking to push an APU hard just, you know, for fun may be interested by this design choice by ASRock's parts, so that's worth noting. MSI's MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi did not perform very well in our testing. There's no denying that, it just didn't perform very well. Even despite the conservative MOSFET temperature readings that we gathered due to our testing difficulties with regards to EMI, positioning of the high and low side MOSFETs and the awkward heatsink design and thermal pan design when installing the MOSFET thermocouples, the readings were not great. Recorded MOSFET temperatures of 80 degrees C according to our thermal couples with sensor readings suggesting 110 degrees C at the highest point are not good for worry-free computing. The PCB temperatures were too high to run this type of current draw on a high-powered Ryzen CPU for extended periods of time. MSI clearly aimed to brute force a large heatsink onto its motherboard to compensate for the use of more basic power delivery components. But according to the temperature data that we recorded, this was not a reasonable design choice for a motherboard that costs more than £200. While we did not see any VRM-induced CPU throttling in our test runs, which is good to report, I wouldn't feel comfortable running my system day-to-day -day knowing that the PCB temperature is sitting more than 100 degrees Celsius with relative ease. We were fortunate enough to have decent case airflow in our testing also, which is not always available to many users. So there we have it. Asus and Gigabyte perform well with their 12-phase deployments, with Asus being slightly better but forcing users to give up OS-based software readings for the VRM sensor as a compromise. Both of these choices are really, really good choices, and that's really unsurprising considering that they're using the most expensive 12-phase power delivery solutions that we see at this £210 price point. ASRock's X570 Steel Legend also performed pretty well, delivering slightly higher temperatures than the ASUS and Gigabyte alternatives, but significantly better temperature performance than the MSI competitor, and that's from its 8-phase CPU vCore VRM, so it's a pretty good one there. MSI's MPG X570 Gaming Edge Wi-Fi uses basic MOSFETs and tries to compensate for this by brute forcing a very large, very overbuilt heatsink onto the motherboard, but this just doesn't really work. We saw sensor readings for the MOSFETs of whether it's 80 degrees according to our thermocouples or 110 degrees according to the sensors. We saw PCB readings of over 100 degrees. Whichever way you look at it, this is not a very good power delivery solution and I wouldn't feel comfortable using this in day-to-day -day usage for an overclock 12 core Ryzen chip. With that said, it's likely to be perfectly fine for people using an 8 core chip and below. But if you're really focused on power delivery solution, you're on the board with the best power delivery solution and the features are all pretty much a moot point to you, then I wouldn't recommend the MSI board based on that. I'd be looking at either the ASRock or the Gigabyte ASUS especially. So thanks for watching. I've been Luke Hill for Kikru. Make sure you let us know in the comments below what you think of this. If this is really interesting to you, let us know. Maybe we'll do some more with some of the higher end offerings or some different platforms.
Like I say, thanks for watching. If you like this video, give us a like, give us a subscribe, hit the bell button. If you want to support Kit Guru, please head on over and see the full review on our written website. That helps us out. You can go to Patreon and help us out there. And you can also buy a cool t-shirt if you want to. So I'll see you in the next one.